This is Tim Storm, former NWA World's Heavyweight Champion. You're listening to What Do You Say with DDJ. If you love professional wrestling, this is where you need to get your information. Don't miss this. Welcome everyone to episode 6 of What Do You Say with DDJ. As always, I am your host DDJ. Uh, first off, before we begin, I'd like to announce, if you haven't seen on my Facebook page, uh, the first five episodes of What Do You Say with past guests including P.L. Myers, uh, Steve Michaels, John Bullard, uh, Frank Rodriguez, and former NWA champion Tim Storm are now available for viewing on YouTube, and you can actually see the video interview, so it's not just audio, so a little extra treat for all my fans out there. And uh, starting with uh, this current episode 6, uh, the YouTube videos should be available either the same day as the podcast goes live, or within the 24 to 48 hours. So video YouTube videos will be up within a, a de- couple of days of uh, the podcast being uh, going live. Uh, going right to it, uh, my guest this week is CCW Superstar. Uh, he's, he's also a man of many hats, which you'll hear in the interview uh, Tully Bertarelli. So uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy uh, episode six of What Do You Say with DDJ with my guest, Tully Bertarelli. Welcome, everyone, to episode six of What Do You Say with DDJ. And with me this evening, I have, he's an action actor, he's a musician, he's an amateur comic book artist, he's a storyteller, he's a comedian, and a motivational speaker, and he also is a wrestler. Basically, he's a man of many hats. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you uh, Tully Bertarelli. Tully, how you doing this evening? Pretty good, pretty good. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for asking. So uh, let's get right into it. Uh, Tell me uh, who Tully Bertarelli is. Uh, Tully Bertarelli is a man of many hats, jack of all trades. My middle name is Jack, so I do many things with my life besides to stay busy, you know. And, uh, yeah, Tully is probably the most unique person you'll ever meet, I think. The best way to describe Tully is unique, tenacious, larger than life, and young. Awesome. At heart. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, Tully, are you from, uh, from the Chicago area? Yeah. So, uh, fun fact about me, I grew up actually in West Lakeview by Cubs Park. I was born in Evanston Hospital, but I was raised in the city my whole life until I turned 19. I played college football for Bridgeton Academy, which I uh, – Played against Ivy League football, such as Yale, Dartmouth, Harvard, Holy Cross. And then after I was done with Bridgeton, I actually went to school down in Florida, a place called Lynn University, where I obtained a a communications degree with a specification in drama studies. So I learned everything from communications like shooting, like behind the camera, in front of the camera, writing for the camera. It made me learn how to be a one-man band, which I'm doing today, you know? Awesome, awesome. Uh, So... uh... What, who, was there anybody in particular that got you into wrestling, like that made you a fan? So, fun fact about this was, when I was the new kid in fourth grade, I used to play WCW NWO World Tour. Love that. And game. I remember playing as Papo Loco, and I, my buddies and I used to beat up the NWO. So I knew who Kevin Nash was, I knew who Six was, I knew who Scott Hall was. And I remember playing Warzone, and I remember these kids were talking about, like, Bret Hart versus Owen Hart in a steel cage. And I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that match. Blah, 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 knowing that that was, like, WrestleMania 10. And I'd never seen it before. So just to be, like, the new kid in school to fit in, I lied and said I liked professional wrestling. So, I mean, I knew Hulk. I mean, like, I used to watch Thunder in Paradise with Hulk Hogan. I know who that guy was <laughs> and stuff like that. 
But probably what captivated me was probably when it was the Rock versus the McCamsley era in like 2000, like, 90, right. like late 99, 2000 with like the Radicals and like the end of the uh, Attitude Era is what I probably got into. But then like I remember again a WrestleMania magazine and seeing everything from back then from like WrestleMania 1 and I just like the World Wide Web really helped me find old school wrestling, which is a huge part of my life. Is like I love everything old school. Like I love world class championship wrestling. I love, you know, mid south. I love the stuff from like the eighties and seventies, you know, even sixties wrestling. Early nineties, yes, you know, with like Herb Abrams UWF or like nineties AWA, like or actually probably like NWA eighty nine through ninety one and WWF. I probably like if people want to ask me like what I like to watch, it's just like those stuff back then because like it was like larger than life back then. And the business has changed tremendously dramatically, you know. I mean, the world of what we know of wrestling is completely changed. Me having this interview with you would not happen thirty years ago. You know? Because mm -hmm. the business was so kept secret, but now Fans know the terms, you know, kayfabe can be still alive, but you have to play to the crowd. It's like a magic trick. You can't give all the secrets away. That makes any sense. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. That really does. You know, like there's the misdirection that, you know, WWE, AEW, Impact, Ring of Honor, like, and Chicagoland Championship Wrestling, the new company I'm working for. Um, we're going to like do the mis like good wrestling, can still do that magic trick where the fan will go to the show and for a slight second be like, oh, crap, that's real. But then you forget that wrestling's all predetermined. The only thing that's fake about wrestling is the finish. Right, right. You know? Right. So who were um, – you mentioned, like, The Rock, you know, talking about when you first started getting into wrestling. Uh, who were some of your other favorites during that, like, late 90s, or early 2000s uh, time frame? Um, I mean, I would like to go back to like, I loved Chris Jericho. I loved Chris Benoit. I loved Dean Malenko, Perry Saturn, Eddie Guerrero, uh, William Regal, Test, um, X-Pac, Road Dog, Billy Gunn, D'Lo Brown. Um, I've always liked the mid-card guys in wrestling because I feel like they were, the, they were like the workhorses. They were the ones that carried the company, but like, as I got older through watching wrestling, I used to be a big rock guy, but then I turned into a Triple H guy, and I've always admire Hunter Hopes Helmsley from a guy. If you just look at his career from the guy that lied his way and saying that he was like a seasoned vet two years into the business wrestling for WCW and becoming the CEO of World Wrestling Entertainment. like I would, My goal in life is actually to shake his hand and actually meet him because – he wasn't a junior. He wasn't anyone related to anyone in the business. He paved his own way and he listened to the guys that were there before him. And now he's passing down that knowledge with NXT and everything like that. So like, I really do respect uh, Triple H, even though a lot of people don't like the Triple H's era in the Ruth of his aggression when he was in Evolution, but I loved Evolution growing up. I mean, come on. Just him dressing up like like just wearing a corporate suit with like lemmy motorhead facial hair and just like you know just being the man you know and having flair be his jj dylan and having like randy orton and all that stuff and having batista you know was just really entertaining to watch you know right yeah i also liked captain charisma christian you know i also enjoyed edge i also enjoyed the evolution of chris jericho like he keeps on evolving every time and he's never stale you know, mm -hmm. he always reinvents his wheel, you know? Yeah. And that's one of the things that like, I really always appreciate, <clears throat> excuse me, appreciate about Jericho is because he's constantly evolved. And one of the things that I think a lot of people like about him is he understands, you know, he's not what he used to be and he has no problem oh, of course, helping yeah. create the new stars. I mean, think about what he, He's done lately for Orange Cassidy. I mean, the match they had just this past weekend at All Out and stuff, you know. And, I mean, I just got done watching him uh, about an hour or so ago on Dynamite, and he made uh, Sonny Kiss and Joey Janela look really good. And I think that's one thing that 
I don't think a lot of people understand how important it is to create, you know, the new stars. I think the thing is that like, we're in a time period now that like, I don't, you know, I don't really, I only watch a few episodes of AEW because I really like watching AEW dark. Cause I have some fr- fellow like friends I know that have wrestled there. Like, you know, um, Efren Sims, Joe Alonzo, um, mm-hmm. Captain, Sean Dean, you know, and stuff like that, or Robert Anthony, you know, and it's just really fun to watch that. But like, I'm not really, I'm not trying to say that AEW is not my style. It's just, it's too quick pace for me. It's, it's, it's too much like, like a live stunt show to me, you know, and I'm very happy that they do have guys like Chris Jericho to elevate those guys. Because if I, when I fall into that career later down my path is I want to be that guy that elevates the next guy. I want to send the elevator down and make the other guy look good because in film, that's what I do, you know, as a stunt man is you make the actor look good, gotcha. you know? And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I feel like Chris Jericho is doing a really good job, especially with his inner circle group, you know, and stuff like that. But I, I'm not going to – I still have a soft spot for the WWE. You know, I just recently heard that uh, – I forgot what Rusev's new name is, but I just heard Rusev is now in AEW. And uh, I, yeah, he actually debuted uh, as Miro, which I believe yeah, is his um, real name. Yeah, I really think that WWE missed the ball on him because uh, – he, in my opinion, was the modern day Nikita Koloff. Oh, I would. You know, he was. Yeah. Yeah, I one hundred percent. And they agree just with they that. they're like, oh, we have a Russian heel. Like, what do we do with this? You can do so much with it. You can make him the Russian babyface mm-hmm. that people liked. I mean, that's why Nikita Koloff was so over was so over with the NWA that he was he fought against the Soviets. And he, he fought us alongside with Dusty Rhodes and the Road Warriors and stuff like that. And people cheered on a foreign dude, you know? It was the misdirection that people believed this dude from Minnesota. You know, the guy even changed his name to Nikita Koloff, you know, to keep the mm-hmm. business, you know? And a lot of guys don't do that anymore. A lot of guys now, you know, they have their Instagram, they have their Facebook, they have their, like, they like to publicize their life as the gimmick. But the thing is, you have to live you have to not show, give away the secrets if you want to be a good performer. You can't give away all the magic tricks, you know, if that makes any sense. That makes uh, perfect sense. So uh, you mentioned Nikita Koloff. Um, who are some of, like, I know you said you, with, since you got, you got into wrestling late 90s, early 2000s, but you've gone back to watch a lot of the older stuff. Who are some of the guys that you really grew to uh, appreciate from, let's say, like the 80s? Uh, I love uh, the Road Warriors. Um, I love the Stein. I love Scott and Rick Steiner from 89 to 91. I mean, they were just phenomenal. Hacksaw, Jim Duggan, Terry Bam Bam Gordy, Dr. Duff, Stephen Williams, the late Bruiser Brody, Dan Hansen. Um, I'm a big fan of all Japan pro wrestling because these are like hosses that are in the ring that don't have the bodybuilder image that like, Vince wanted, but these guys were like larger than live spectacles in Japan and the Japanese audience just fell in love with it. You know, it was like they were superhuman. Uh, I also liked guys like British Bulldog, uh, Dynamite Kid. Um, I've also enjoyed, you know, Bret Hart when he was a tag partner with the the Hart Foundation. I always loved the late Owen Hart. I always thought Owen Hart was phenomenal. I loved, uh, you know, I know a lot of people give me crap, but like I liked Jeff Jarrett. You know, Jeff Jarrett's another guy like Jericho where he reinvents the wheel in his character, you know. He went from being the country singer than being the chosen one, mm-hmm. you know. Um, loved guys like Jerry Lawler, um, Bill Dundee, Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. Um, I loved guys like the Destroyer, uh, the Crusher, the Bruiser, um, Moose Cholak, uh, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers, Arn Anderson, you know, the list just, uh, even, I know people make fun of me for this, but like, in a way, Luger was entertaining, even though like everyone says he was a horrible performer. But if you put him with a good person like Sting or Flair, it would make him a million bucks, like Barry Windham. Um, the list goes on and on about guys from the 80s that just, if you rewatch the stuff they were doing, it was so simple and good storytelling that they didn't have to do 50 million flips. 
they took their time. They re- made the fans register a punch. You know, I remember watching one match. I forget. Oh, Rick Martel's another guy. Um, watch Kurt Henning in AWA. Like, people want to praise him about me, Mr. Perfect. But, like, when he was in the AWA, he was just, like, God's gift of pro wrestling. And, like, I also love Scott Hall in the, in the early days, too, you know? Um, it's just stuff back then is more, way more entertaining than now. I do give credit to the guys now in the business that are more athletic and everything like that. And they look more like, like NBA athletes or football players, but like, I still enjoy like the whole larger than life personas. Like, come on, Buzz Sawyer, Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer. Mm -hmm. Great talent. Uh, Johnny Ace. I know people give him crap, but I love Johnny Ace. You know, John Laurinaitis is phenomenal like any of these guys i just i can watch a world i can go on the network and watch like some old school stuff and find something entertaining i remember watching a bam bam gordy match against um i forgot who the the carpenter was but like all they did was just punch and kick for like six hours six minutes and it was amazing because it looked like a real fight like the big guys in wrestling don't have to do what the little guys do like i give credit to keith lee for breaking that norm but like watch fader back in the day like fader broke the norm of being a big dude but oh my god like he could fly he you was, know yeah, absolutely um so when did you uh decide that professional wrestling was something you wanted to do when i was 11 years old okay um i remember creating characters all the time and being 11 years old and telling my cousins and my aunties and uncles in England, fun fact, I'm a dual citizen um, of the UK, telling them or telling my dad's extended family that that's what I want to be in life. I want to either be a rock star. I want to be a wrestler. I want to be a comedian. I want to be an actor. Like I want to entertain people the rest of my life. And what was the re- your family's reaction like when you told them that you were becoming a wrestler? Um, if you get hurt, don't complain to us, you know, don't get in a feeding tube when you're 30, you know, I'm 32 now and knock on wood. I haven't been in a feeding tube. Um, just be safe, you know, and I've done a lot of cool stuff within performing, you know, when I was in high school, I used to host a teen open mic and that's how I got my mic skills and my stage present. And that's how I got into more storytelling and like stand up and everything like that. And then when I went to college, instead of being an animator, I went to school for theater because I wanted to learn to be an actor, to be a better pro wrestler speaker, which my drama teachers made fun of me all the time. They're like, yeah, that's the worst excuse to be a drama major. To be a better pro wrestler? Okay. You know? Yeah, and I, I just think that's one thing that I don't think a lot of people, I think a lot of people that don't understand what professional wrestling is, they don't understand how important something like you just mentioned about being a drama major really is, because when you think about it, you know, a lot of what you do, you know, be, you know, on screen is, is really about the same. I would say what you do in the ring. And so, cause I mean, you're, you're, you're playing yeah, pretty much. Character. I mean, um, you're, you're playing yourself and you're turned up 11, right. You know, you're telling stories yeah. you're, you know, and stuff. And I just don't, I think a lot of people that don't understand what professional wrestling is, doesn't get that and it's a shame because it's 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 it takes a truly talented person to be able to do stuff like that um yeah and go ahead i'm sorry oh no worries uh my my roommate's cats are fighting it's hilarious um no but what i was saying too is um it's really funny that wrestling is so saturated in the market just like acting and music and everything like that there's so much of it but the thing is there is a good wrestler, and then there's a good storyteller, if mm. that makes any sense. No, I, like I, the guys, I, I, the people, you know, and like you can look at all these guys and just pinpoint why they're on TV because they're the ones that tell the good stories. People want to make fun of John Cena doing five do- moves of doom, but guess what? The fuck, the, can I swear on your thing or no? It's fine. Okay. Um, he can fucking, he gets over. The fucking kids love him. Mm-hmm. Robin Reigns finally went heel and the fucking smarts are just fucking cheering for that shit because they're just like, holy crap, they're listening. You know, the fucking, the people in back are listening to what the fans want. And I honestly think WWE is going into a different direction of the sense that they're going cinematic with everything. Like 
the Funhouse match was probably the most acid trip thing I've ever seen in professional wrestling. The Boneyard match reminded me of Walker, Texas Ranger. It was just beautiful cinema. And like, that's what wrestling's becoming again. It's becoming the 80s montage workout videos. Or like, you know, like if you watch the, fa- you ever look up like the Fantastics promo video package? It's like the most sexualized thing ever. And it's hilarious to watch because you look at it like, wow, that's really, really different. That's really, you know, hmm. But at the same time, that's what they did to sell wrestlers. They sold larger than life things. Like, and you know what? For Taker to go off on a cinematic ending for his career is probably the best thing that he could do. You know? Right, because I even think he said in the uh, in the uh, the documentary series that they put out, the WWE Network put out the very last episode. I think he said that was the way he wanted to go out. So I mean, and I agree. I think that was a yeah, right. He, he a, wanted to go off in the sunset. Okay, so uh, he wanted uh, to ride the sunset. Right, exactly. So you met. We t- we're talking about you know comparisons of being a you know a professional wrestler and an actor, and I, and you can actually speak to it to a lot a lot better than most because you actually do both. <laughs> um, how did you uh, now? Did you yeah. transition from the world of wrestling into acting, or was acting first before wrestling? Uh no, wrestling. Uh, the thing is, in between college summers, I would go back and train with Steve Boz from Windy City Wrestling. Okay. Um. And then I picked up some things and I learned how to ref. I learned how to manage. I learned how to just be a ring announcer, learn how to be a ring. Review. I learned how to be a utility guy in the business because they knew I knew how to act. So they gave me the microphone because they knew I had the gift to gab, if that made any sense. Yeah. And then I learned, I went on and worked for Blitz and did referee work. And probably my, one of my favorite moments was refereeing the half pine brawlers. Imagine me being six foot two <laughs> refereeing these little people. It was amazing. It was super fun. And I learned psychology from that. And uh, it was just really cool that I got to grasp every part of the business. And I still love doing other things besides being a wrestler. Like, I like, you know, when younger guys ask me for advice, even though, like, I don't know why they listen to me, but I guess I'm like a teacher now. But, uh, but besides that, it's just my way to pass down because all the knowledge I got from my mentors in wrestling, it's the way to pass the torch because – when you enter that brotherhood of professional wrestling, you can't be the, you know, you can't be the egotistical maniac. You can't be the cocky one because like cocky doesn't get you anywhere in life in professional wrestling. If you're cocky, get the hell out of the fucking business because you're not going to get anywhere because everyone doesn't want to work with you. And they think you're just fucking just, they just think your shit sucks. You know, Um, be humble. Just always be humble. Keep your eyes open and your ears you know, and keep your mouth shut and your ears open because you never know what opportunity you're going to get. Right. You know, this year alone has been a very interesting year. Like, yeah, we're under a COVID-19 and I've wrestled in a COVID show and stuff like that with COVID rules and people wearing masks and having the chairs six feet apart and everything like that. And dude, it's, it's weird. It's so fucking weird, you know? And, But, you know, we're going to get through this. And, you know, on October 3rd, I got a match coming up for Chicagoland Championship Wrestling. It's going to be on Amazon Prime. And this is the second time I've been on Prime. Well, third time, but first time with wrestling, I should say, that I'm going to be on a larger scale. You know? Mm -hmm. As my friends quoted, everyone has known me my whole life. Everyone knew Tully growing up in Chicago. Like, you didn't know Tully didn't exist. That's what they used to say, which is funny. Mm -hmm. But now my friends are saying, in 2021 and then on the whole world will know your name. They will know Mr. Made for TV, Tully Bergerelli. They will know what television is. And it's, 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 it's really interesting, man. It's kind of scary, but I'm, I'm really excited for it. You got to follow the fear. Uh, Del Close used to say that. Del Close was a guy I looked up to that was like the professor of long form comedy. He invented the Herald. He invented the yes and way, you know, he used to always say treat everyone like an artist and hero because you're better off on stage. I compare the stage to life. I, when I meet new people, I don't judge people. I just take the people who they are and get to know who they really are and give them that like leverage, you know? Yeah. Cause I mean, and my whole thing is, is don't assume you know someone because I mean, you could be way off. I mean, I've, there's a lot of people I've encountered in life that I've had, you know, assumptions about but then once i got to know them it's like you know they were the complete opposites of what i thought you know so i mean i 
wholeheartedly uh, can agree with, you know, you, you know, taking the time to get to know people versus rather than creating the assumptions, you know, assumptions of that. And you mentioned, you know, the, the October 13th, yeah. your match and stuff. We're going to get to that a little bit later in the, in the show here and stuff, but I want to kind of go into more of like now, like you, you're acting and stuff. Uh, what are some of the uh, shows that you've been on and like uh, some of the things that you like, you know, your roles and all that good stuff? Yeah, of course. Um, so, uh, I'm a stunt performer, but I'm also an actor. So the term is called action actor because uh, that's what we're, some of us are giving lines now. So that's why we do the term action actor. When people hear that, they think I'm a porn star. I'm like, no, not quite. But uh, cool thing is I've worked on shows such as Dick Wolf, Chicago PD. I've been, I've worked on Lee Daniels Empire numerous times. I was on a movie with Machine Gun Kelly and John Goodman called Captive State that came out last year, but everyone else watched Captive Marvel instead. But you can go on Amazon Prime and watch it. Uh, recently, um, which is coming out September 27th, uh, you'll see me on the new season of Fargo on FX. And that was, yeah. besides Captive State, Fargo was uh, the most craziest time of my career so far, just because, like, one, it was the hardest stunt to take. I can't really, because I, I signed this, the closure, but right. be on the lookout for this mug on Fargo. Will do. You know, but, but when I worked on Captive State, it was really funny. I got thrown against a wall by a SWAT team like 50 dudes like threw me against the wall and I talked to this guy and I thought he was the AD and we were just like shooting shit. And like, I, I heard that he had an English accent. I was like, Oh shit. You know, like, where are you from? And he's like, oh, I'm from England. You know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, Oh, my father's from England. You know, I'm not happy. You know, he didn't. He's like, Oh no shit. I'm like, what's your, he's like, what's your name? I'm like, Oh, my name's Big T or Tully. He's like, all right, Big T, my name's Rupert. And like, as I'm going back to my trailer, I look up the cast. And I see that Rupert Wyatt was the director of the movie. The guy who directed Planet of the Apes was talking to me. Oh, wow. And I was like, and I was like holy shit. Like, this guy treated me like a fucking regular dude. Like, it was so, like, cool. Like, I've worked on, um, fun fact on me, I was on Drunk History of Derek Waters. Okay. Uh, you, can look that, you can look that up. I'm on the Chicago episode. I talk about my Abe Lincoln tattoo. Um, I was on the Steve Harvey show as an audience plant. Uh, you can look that up on YouTube. It's Yo Mama, a wingman. <laughs> um, I asked Steve if my mom could be a good wingman. He chewed up me on live TV. It's the best Mother's Day gift ever. But, like, I've had fun stuff in my career. Like, if I die the next day, I can just say I had a fun career within show business. I never really thought. You know, I never was like, oh, man, I want to be Academy Award winner actor. You know, my thing is I just want to be the guy that keeps on working and keeps on getting better as a performer. Awesome. You know, because acting's shifting, too, because they're not casting met much method actors. They're casting people that play themselves. Like, look at The Rock. Look at Kevin Hart. They're pretty much themselves on camera. Like, that's them in real life. Mm -hmm. You know, like, The Rock is a fucking badass. Kevin Hart is fucking hilarious. Jack Black is fucking hilarious. These guys are magicians in film that are just fucking amazing, man. And yes, there are movies that are like stylized and stuff like that, like a Tim Burton movie or anything like that, or like The Witch, The Witchers with Henry Cavill, or like those Marvel films are very stylized. But like I put it this way, like I just love what I do. Um, I also do music. Uh, I'm in two bands. One band is on Spotify or Bandcamp called Billy Club Master Chef. It's an industrial synth rock band. We're very much the butthole surfers meet scary human. And then uh, I'm in the works of a new band. Uh, we don't have any music. We're in pre-production, but we're called Tully and the Lobotomies. And it's just a garage band. It's just me, my friend, and his wife. It's just us having fun. You cool. know? So, okay. So kind of going into a little bit of movie talk here. What's your, uh, what would you say is your all-time favorite movie and why? Oh, shit. Uh, it's a tie, actually. It's a three-way okay, tie. It's both. They're both. Batman 1989, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and Back to the Future 2. Oh, my God. You are, like, speaking my language right there with those three. Those are, like, some of my favorites. I love time traveling movie. I always wanted to get punched. My career in cinema is to get punched in the face by Indiana Jones or Batman. But my whole thing is I just love the Indiana Jones franchise. I even like the fourth one. I know a lot of people are going to comment and be like, the fourth one fucking sucks. It, it made sense to have aliens, motherfucker. You know? Um, but also, Batman 1989, that fucking soundtrack with Prince is so fucking beautiful. A lot of people know this, that Michael Jackson was approached to do the soundtrack, but he turned it down to do Moonwalker. Wow. 
Wow. I don't think I knew that. Yeah. But like that, that soundtrack, I don't think Prince ever played any of those songs live, but like you listen to that soundtrack and it's just a time capsule of movies. I also like, you know, another movie I like is Earth Goes are easy with Damon Wayans and Jim Carrey and Jeff Goldblum and Gina Davis mm-hmm. because that's like the ultimate 80s movie for me. If I want to, when I have kids, if I play a time capsule movie for the 80s, it's either going to be Batman or, you know, Earth Fills are easy. Nice, yeah. It's before In Living Color, which is really funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you mentioned uh, um, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade and Back to the Future too, and those are actually – Personally, like in Last Crusade's my favorite of the Indiana Jones movies, and out of the three Back to the Future movies, here, yeah. the second one is is my is my favorite. Actually, it was on TV I think the other day, and like I said, it's one of those where anytime any of the Back to the Future movies are on TV, even though I own them, I sit down and I'll watch it on TV as well too because they're that good. Oh fuck yeah, man! And it's on Netflix now, which is cool too. I, I was watching Toads earlier before we did this, but I was gonna I was literally super close to watch Back to the Future one, and I was just like, no, I'm uh. I'm uh, I'm gonna hold off. Maybe I can do back. But the thing is, if it's on, I'm the same way. What I love about Back to the Future Two and Back to the Future One, it's just like it's a classic. Like, and I I, I know I'm I'm so happy that Hollywood will never remake it because the director yeah. of the film has a clause that says, if I pass, my children will never make a remake of this movie. They should never remake that movie because that is such a classic. That is a time capsule movie. That is a movie that like legit like time traveling it's like also like the terminator franchise i love the terminator franchise mm-hmm. you know if you actually watch the first terminator arnold schwarzenegger has 18 words of dialogue but he is like the first superhuman actor the fucking first muscle bound dude that like i mean james Cameron told him is like all i want you to do is be a stone cold killer i want you to just move like a killer and like you look at that movie and you're like holy shit that dude's like because at the time if you look at the time period of terminator one the lead actors that people of hollywood was like dustin hoffman robert redford um christopher walken robert de niro mm-hmm. no one had muscles like arnold schwarzenegger and that's why it inspired stuff like sylvester stallone to do like you know more rocky movies and chuck norris and john Clem van damme and stuff like that cool so who would you say was your uh is your favorite uh, actor of all time? Uh, Christopher Walken. Okay. That's a good one. Love, I love, love Christopher Walken. Um, I like Chris Hemsworth a lot. I love the rock. I love Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, as an actor, but also a person, I admire him living the American dream. Mm -hmm. You know, a guy that came over from the States, you know, from, you know, Austria and, basically paved his way, said he was going to be Mr. Universe, going to be an actor, going to, was going to be in politics and marry Kennedy, and he did all four. Um, even though he fucked the maid, that was kind of fucked up. But um, um, I also love Harrison Ford. Uh, I love Robin Williams. I miss him dearly. I actually have a, a pan flute on my um, left arm for the movie Hook. Okay. Because I love that movie to death, and I can watch. That's another movie I can watch all the time, and like it's just it puts a tear in my eye that we, you know, a couple years ago we lost him because that was the man I always wanted to shake his hand. I also loved Chris Farley. Um, I loved, um, you know, Farley was one of my heroes. John Candy, you know, I love uh, Dan Aykroyd. Um, Jeff Goldblum early on, not not Jeff Goldblum now, but I always loved Jeff Goldblum like The Fly. Walken was always good because Walken was like Shakespeare, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Like everything he did from like The Dead Zone, The Kings of New York, and like Pulp Fiction. Bruce Willis is fun to watch. Um, Joseph Gordon-Levin's a lot of fun to watch. I kind of like James Franco. Some stuff. Paul Rudd's fun. Jason Segel, I think, is hilarious. Um. There's just a lot. I, I, there's there's a lot of people I just love to watch. Christian Bale can be entertaining, you know. Um, Jared Leto can have his moments. Matthew McConaughey is probably uh, is fun. Ben Affleck and Matt Damon are fun to watch. It's, it's I just like watching movies. It's probably I will love going to the movies, and that's probably one thing I miss about COVID. Right. Is that we can't go to the movie theater, you know. 
I look forward to the, like the blockbusters. I look forward f- towards like the slashers in the fall time. I look forward towards, you know, movies in December that are like or November when they're like Christmas movies. And they're like, why is this movie coming out November fourth and it's a Christmas movie? <laughs> you know, it's just it's just stupid. You know, as a person that's Santa Claus, I run a Santa business for the holidays in November, and December. It's just hilarious. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, I do it every year. Um, and I have my own suit, and I dye my beard white. I grow it a little bit thicker, and uh, I go around and I uh, do parties for adults, for children, or schools, or grocery stores, or bars. You know, just to have kids smile. You know, that's that's that's, that's awesome. Okay, so 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 you brought up Christmas movies, so I have to ask: Die Hard and Gremlins, Christmas movies or not? And I'm talking the original Gremlins. Uh, Gremlins. Yeah, Gremlins one, yes. Die Hard, yes. But the thing is, I can I always argue, and I say the best Christmas movie of all time is either Scrooge or Jumanji. Okay, Scrooge. <laughs> or ba- I I could see Scrooge, but I don't think I've ever heard Jumanji referred to as a Christmas movie. So, can you elaborate a little bit on why you would consider Jumanji a Christmas movie? In the end of the movie, it takes place in Christmas. Ah, you're right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another movie that I love that's a Christmas movie is Muppets Christmas Carol. Um, yes. Let's see what else. I love the Santa Claus movies. They're just terrible to watch, but they're just fun to watch. <laughs> um, I mean, who doesn't like National Lampoon, like Christmas Vacation? I mean, like, come on, Chevy Chase is probably favorite, a few things. Favorite Christmas movie. Yeah. Um, it's another great Christmas movie. Uh, fucking Elf. Come on, man. Like, you, Will Ferrell was genius in that. Yes, he was. Uh, I consider Batman Returns a weird, a dark Christmas movie. Yeah, I guess I could yeah. see that. Yeah, it took place in Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, in the end, but people are like, well, if it takes place in the Christmas the end, it's not really Christmas. I'm like, well, it's like wintertime all the time, if y'all remember. You know? Right. Um, so now like talking of, you know, I'm, about, too. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm, I missed that. No, I, uh, home alone too. You can't go wrong with, no, you can't go along, along with that. So another question in terms of regarding the world of acting, is there anybody like, you know, big name actor that like you were excited to work with that like lived up to the hype? And then was there anybody that you worked with that you'd say would kind of disappointed you in terms of how they were as a person? Uh, I never really had a bad experience with anybody. Uh, when I worked on Steve Harvey's show as an audience plan, I didn't get to meet Steve Harvey. But when I was a featured extra in Divergent, I got to meet like a bunch of the main cast. Uh, my friend knew his best friends with Jack Courtney, so I made him break character, which was really funny. Um, when I did fun background work for Dawn of Justice, I got to meet Zack Snyder. Um, I actually, when I worked on Empire the first time, I actually got to meet Terrence Howard. Oh, we didn't wow. really have a, I didn't really have a serious conversation. It was just like, really cold out and this like extra girl was wearing a cocktail dress and she was freezing cold. And he looked at oh, my buddy EJ and I was like, I don't feel bad for you. I feel feel bad for her and get her a fucking coat guys. Um, the last scene I did on empire, I worked with Felicia Rashad from the Cosby show and Wood oh, Harris wow. from remember the Titans. And that was just super cool. Um, let's see what also, um, I uh, I never really had any weird moments. Um, I also love Comic Con. It's one of my favorite things to do. I love talking to celebrities. I mean, like me too. Uh, there was one guy that was a dick. I I don't. He'll probably never hear about this. But uh, Joey Lawrence was. Pr- it's a funny story because this is when I met Doug Jones, who's probably one of my favorite heroes. Hi, Doug. I love you to death, man. I, I met got him. He's a real good dude. Yeah, I met Sean Young. She's awesome. Even though she's crazy, love that girl. But. Joey Lawrence was uh, at a booth, and I was with my buddy Joe Murray at the time, and like I was like, "Whoa, it's Joey Lawrence!" Whoa, and he's just like, "Oh God, fucking kid!" Like he's just like he gets this all the time, you know. And like I talked to him, and I'm like super like marking out, and just like, "Hey man, you got any advice for like an up and coming actor?" He's like, "Yeah, I moved to L.A., kid." And then like he leaves his table, and all of a sudden like I hear from a distance, and I hear like a guy say, "Hey kid, don't worry about that man. Uh, his assistant got his coffee wrong." And I turn around and it's fucking Luke Perry. 
<laughs> and I was just like, holy fucking shit, you're fucking Luke Perry. He's like, yep, yeah, that's me, man. What's your name, kids? And my buddy's like, oh, I'm Joe. And I'm like, oh, man, my name's Tully. He's like, oh, yeah, my favorite professional wrestling. And we said the same time. Tully Blanchard? He's like, yeah, man, fuck yeah. I told him I wrestled and everything like that. And he's like, yeah, my son's a big wrestling fan and blah, 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 blah. And, like, I hope I get to meet Jungle Boy just to tell him that story. Because, like, his dad was, like, wicked cool with me. When I got to meet Doug Jones at Comic-Con that evening, too, that was wicked cool. He looked to my forehead and told me I was born to be a creature actor. That's one of my goals in Hollywood is to be a, a monster in the film. Cool. Um, but, uh, no, just yeah, you- I have a lot of goals. A lot of goals. Go I didn't mean to cut you off there. Keep going. You had a lot of goals. Uh, be a monster, get punched by Batman or Indiana Jones, voice a cartoon, and have fun. An interesting bucket list. Now, just real out of curiosity, was that convention, was that 2012 by chance when you saw Doug Jones and Joey? Yeah. Okay, because I actually was yeah. at the World that year, and that's the year I met Bolt, because I met Doug Jones, and I marked out when I found out he was uh, Mac Tonight from the old uh, McDonald's commercials. I didn't know that until I went up there and saw the picture. Oh, dude, when I was looking at his – when I went to his booth and I saw that, like, he was the tall clown from Hocus Pocus uh, – the tall clown from Batman Returns. He was Silver Surfer. He was, like, Billy from Hocus Pocus. I'm like, who the fuck are you? He's like, oh, I'm Doug Jones. Nice to meet you, man. And I'm like, dude, you're like my fucking childhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. And I always, and I told him like, yo, man, I don't have any money, but like, I, I'll tell you one thing, man. It's like, my biggest dream is to be like one of the creature actors like yourself. And he grabbed my head and licked my forehead, like right here. <laughs> and he's like, one of these days you'll be born and you will be a creature in a film. And like, Doug, the cool thing about Doug is he operates his own social media. So we talked during quarantine and it was really cool to always reconnect with him if anyone knows Doug like I do a screenshot and send it to Doug and he'll be like oh look at the beautiful people and he's such an awesome motivational speaker you know he talks to the youth about his experience and he's just a really down to heart celebrity and I hope I mean when he got like Shape of Water I wish they recognized him more for what he did Mm -hmm. and I I know the Academy is going to recognize him one day but they should have recognized him for that movie because that was just a beautiful film yeah I went um when I met him, like I said, I didn't realize he played Mac tonight from the old McDonald's commercials, I think from like the late eighties and stuff. And he's like, Oh yeah. Then we actually started singing the little jingle and the picture I took with him is like right at like one of my friends took and like we had just finished. So I had this like really goofy look on, on my face and stuff. But yeah, no, I really enjoyed talking yeah. and that. So, um, so, yeah. so we're going to go back into the world of professional wrestling here. Um, the uh, you, like I said, you have some uh, you have a match coming up at the uh, on October third as part of the uh, Amazon Prime tapings for Chicago Land Championship Wrestling. Uh, let, uh, talk about uh, what your what the match is and uh, yeah, go from there. Just like talk about the match, the where, where when all yeah. that. Um, so uh, let's cut the chase. October third, Michigan City, Indiana. Uh, the flyer will be. You probably have the flyer on your page, correct? Or should I send you the flyer real quick? I ha- I have it uh, I have it I have it somewhere on my computer yes I don't have it like all right cool um uh I'm in a tag match because a while ago um there is these fellow guys called the Thieves of Greatness that basically did a, a complaint about not being on the flyer and uh, I decided to challenge them when I was on last man uh, when I was on another podcast called Last Man uh, Last Man Standing or Last Man Talking with Steve Barnett. And uh, I called out the Thieves of Greatness, Theo Storm and Isaiah Moore. Because uh, I have a partner of mine that uh, just got announced, and it's uh, Solemn Stone. Okay. He is a God's gift athlete. Um, he's a man you don't want to mess with. He's an enforcer. You know, he's, he brick. he's built like a brick. But uh, Theo Storm and Isaiah Moore, everybody watch out for the Sin City Playboys. Don't let the picture of us on the flyer fool you. You know, I'm six foot two. I weigh about 260 pounds of twisted steel, mean green and fighting COVID-19 every day. You know? Awesome. I'm just going to teach. I'm just, uh, my uh, objective because I'm being represented by uh, Entourage Unlimited by Bo Anderson. And he's representing the Sin City Playboys, and we're here to teach lessons 
to the youth of Chicagoland wrestling, you know, Chicagoland championship wrestling. Cause there's a big problem with these young bucks, these young greenhorns think they can get away with what they want. I've been in this business since 2008, first broken in 2006, was supposed to be in 2003. And every day since then on and off, I've been paving my way and paying my dues. And I still pay my dues. I still show up for ring crew and set up. I am very humble and I will make them humble. I will make them remember my name and also the crowd will remember my name. And the people that are gonna buy the episode on Amazon Prime will remember the name Mr. May for TV, Tully Bertorelli. And when they watch their television, they will adjust it to a certain dial because it is time for television. Wow, well, it sounds like the thieves of uh, greatness have their work cut out for them and that. So, but uh, Tully, I want to wish you all the, the, the luck in the world with your match coming up on October 3rd. Um, and I want to thank you for being a guest on my show tonight. And uh, any last words? Thanks, yeah, of course. Awesome. Any last, uh, any last yeah. words or parting thoughts before we go? Yeah, uh, be excellent to each other. And if you'd like to follow me on Instagram, you can follow me at Tully Bertorelli. That's T-U-L-O-Y-B-E-R-T-O-R-E-L-L-I. It's the best way to follow my uh, adventures. I do have a Facebook, but I have a private life that I don't really accept fans. But if you add me on Instagram, you can follow my journey. Uh, as of today, I am eight months and 12 days uh, sober, and I'm very happy to be alive. And I thank all my friends and my support system out there. Congratulations. You know? That's That's amazing. That's I got I got mad respect for anybody that you know can do that because it's not easy. So good for you. No, it, it's a journey. It's a very much journey. That's a, awesome. All right. Well, Tully, thanks again for your time, and uh, you have a good night. And I hope to see you at the tapings here in a couple weeks. Sounds good, man. All right, see you, Dennis. Thanks. All right. Thanks to Tully Bertarelli for taking time out of his night to chat with me. I really enjoyed everything he had to say, uh, from the wrestling talk to the TV talk to uh, a little bit of a movie chat and all of that. Um, you can check him and the rest of the superstars of Chicagoland Championship Wrestling out on Saturday, October 3rd at the American Legion 451, located at 121 Squiat. SKWIAT Legion Avenue in Michigan City, Indiana. Uh, tickets are $10 a piece, or you can get a family four pack for $30. Uh, these will be tape episodes taped for Amazon Prime, so you can pay, you know, anywhere between $7.50 and $10, and you could possibly go see yourself on Amazon Prime or Comcast uh, in Chicago. Uh, before we call it a night here. I'd like to tell, as always, thank my best friend in the world, Andre Boyd, for providing the music you hear during the show. And uh, before I call it a night for real, I just want to give a shout out to this week. I'm going to be a little cliche and give a shout out to my mom, uh, who's just an amazing woman who, while she may have not always agreed with the things that in life that... I've done or the choices I made she was always there for me and she's someone that I know I can always count on uh, mom you're probably not listening to this because I know you don't like wrestling but thank you for everything you've done for me and you know I love you so much and on that note everybody have a good night and we'll see you in a, about a week with another episode of what do you say with DDJ thanks <laughs>